Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you here today. For those on live stream, YouTube and Facebook, it's great to have you here today. God's in a wonderful mood. And uh, he's got a great word for you today. So I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 11. I'm going to be reading from the CEV. And uh, we're going to believe today for God to just to release something great in this place. When, when I preach, the word of the Lord says that his words are spirit and they are life. So I believe that as I speak today, life will come to you and there will be openings of the spirit realm for you to enter into. I don't know if you know that, but when an anointed man or woman preaches the word, there are always spiritual invitations to come up higher. There are doorways, and some people think that's weird. Well, that's, that's how the word works. When you read the Bible, it's a living invitation for an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So as the word is preached, look for those moments when you sense the Spirit of God moving and by faith step into it and say, I'll take that, that's mine. The woman with the issue of blood did that. She recognised her moment. She reached out and she grabbed her breakthrough. Nobody else in the crowd got it but one woman. The four men who carried the paraplegic, they broke through the roof. They realised their moment and they took it. And there's something about when we come together, God opens up realms for men and women of faith to step into. When Paul's preaching, is it Eutychus? He's sitting on the outside and he finds an opening, but it's an opening for a fall because he's spiritually asleep. And so I want to say to you today, as you sit here today, don't be spiritually asleep and walk out and say, what in the heck was that about? Or what's for dinner? What's for lunch? But whoever has ears to hear and eyes to see, step into the realm of the Spirit because God's got a word for you today. Amen? Isaiah 54 is the chapter all about the new covenant. It begins with a barren woman and it ends up with a city on a hill that is influencing nations. It is the story of the birth and the maturity of the bride of Christ. And that's us today. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you today as our supreme teacher. You are the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I offer myself to you today as your vessel to speak the word of the Lord to your people. We thank you, Lord God, that as I speak, that lives will be touched and transformed. We welcome you now. Come, Holy Spirit, enable me to declare your word with clarity and truth and power today. I need you. We need you today, Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. This is going to be good. Isaiah 54, 11. I'm doing part two. Last week I began from a tent to a city. Isaiah 54 begins with a tent in verse 2 and it ends with a city in verse 11. There is a progression and I want you to think about, have you ever seen the pictures of Melbourne when it was being formed as a city? I don't know if you've seen it, but the dirt roads, even in the city and the, the horse and carts going down and the, uh, the biggest uh, building in the city was, the, well, the tallest building was the church. Ironic, now it's the bank. <laughs> Somehow we lost our influence, but it's coming back. From a tent to a city. So when God talks about the church being a city, I want you to think about what a city means. Its influence, its, its stability, its permanence, its influence. And we know that all around the world there's an urbanisation taking place where cities, mega cities are being built. And in the spirit realm, God is building a people that are a city. Jesus said, you are a small country town. No, he said, you are a city Amen. on a hill. Amen. 
The, that hill is a picture of Eden. You're a city. What I began in Eden, I'm going to finish. And so he says, O Jerusalem, you are sad and discouraged, tossed around in a storm. Maybe you felt like that. Maybe the church has felt like that, sad, discouraged, and tossed around. But I, the Lord, I'm going to rebuild your city with precious stones and your foundation, for your foundation, I will use blue sapphires. I could do with a few blue sapphires, precious stones. Put your hand down, Karen. You ever been that with your wife? You go past the jewellery store and you quickly go across to the other side. I bind you in Jesus' name. They should, they should have shutters on those windows. And, oh, I don't know what they're doing. They set up men for fire, I'm sure of it. Anyway, let's not be sidetracked. Thank you, Lord, for increase. Your fortresses, your windows will be built of rubies and your gates of jewels and the walls will be built of gems. How amazing. This is a picture. This is a, a picture, an image that Isaiah has seen of the glorious church in all its fullness. Isaiah declares at the beginning that God is a husband to a bride and now he's a builder of a city. Abraham looked for two things. You know, he looked for a bride, for his son, yes, and he looked for a city. It says, I believe somewhere it says, it is in Hebrews 11 verse 9, that Abraham looked for a city. He looked for a city whose builder was God. Had The foundations were were built by God. Abraham was looking in the spirit because he was a man that dwelled in the tent, but he could look into the spirit realm and he saw, I don't know how he did it, it was God. He looked way into the future to our day and beyond and he saw the church going from a tent to a city. When God called Abraham, he was but one. Say but one. He was one person when God called him, but he blessed him and made him many. Abraham looked into the distance and he saw a church that had filled the earth with the glory of God. Amazing. What a man of faith. In Revelation, John sees a bride who is a city. And I began to show last week, and I'm going to unpack it today, that Revelation was and is a book all about the new covenant believer in the church. John saw a bride that had become a city. He called it New Jerusalem. And Jerusalem in the Old Testament was a city that was renowned for one thing, where God and man mingled as one. What an amazing city. When you walked, no wonder they were glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. When they went to Mount Zion, they sung and rejoiced because it was a city that when you stepped into the thresholds of that city, boom, the presence of God filled that city like no city on earth. No wonder they were glad to go to the city of David. And so John sees in the spirit like Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 54 is unpacked in Revelation chapter 21. This glorious city where God and man are so mingled. So that tells me that when we come together, the church of the living God, when people come into our presence, boom, like it did in Jerusalem, I feel the presence Surely the presence of God is in this place. When people walk into your house, boom, there's a lot of booming going on here. They feel there's something different because we are a people that are God mingled. We have become one with God. In this place is the presence, the Shekinah glory of God. John prophesied, the Holy Spirit took him up into the realm of the Holy Spirit and he saw a people so infused with the Holy Ghost. Imagine a company of people like that. Imagine that, a city. Imagine a city on earth today that when you walk into the very boundaries of Melbourne, people are slain in the Spirit. We have seen the prototype of that when Amy McPherson, he thought I was talking about you, 
when they would come to her meeting, sometimes they'd come to the outskirts of that meeting and the presence of God would go for kilometres out from that meeting and people would be coming by via train and they would come into the perimeter of the glory of the God-mingled people and boom, they would be slain in the spirit. People that didn't even know Jesus would encounter his presence. John saw a city and these jewels, these Rubies, these diamonds, these, what was the other one? Sapphires. These are all pictures of the glory of God in its fullness. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So Revelation chapter 21, John begins to unpack this glorious city. He said, and I want you to turn with me to that, verse 1. He said, I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I told you last week that the Jews believed that this was a direct picture of the temple. The temple had a heaven and an earth. And they saw this as a, John saying, the old is past and the new has come. He says, and there is no longer any sea. We know the sea is a picture of the Gentiles. So when Jesus came and died, he, he bridged the gap between the Jew and the Gentile. There's no more Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We are all one in Christ. We who had no hope, who are strangers to the covenant, have been brought in. There is no longer a sea. There's a new heaven and a new earth. We are now one with Christ. That We don't have to go to a tabernacle or a temple because we now are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He resides in us. What an amazing thing. He goes on to say in verse 2, I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared like a bride, adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people, and He will dwell among them, and they will be His people, and God will be among them. Has that happened today? Yes. Has that happened today? Is the tabernacle of God among people? Are you the temple of the Holy Ghost? John was seeing. You can understand this is revelation because pre-Jesus, they had to go to Jerusalem to meet with the Lord. Now John's saying, I've seen everything turned upside. Now the very presence of God isn't in a temple. It is in people, a God-mingled people. This is revolutionary. He will wipe away their tears. There no longer will be any death. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. For the first things have passed away or the old order has ceased. So some people thought that meant this is in the faraway heaven where nobody dies. John is using a figurative language. He's saying there's no longer any death, spiritual death. There's no longer mourning or crying because Jesus has come to people and heal them. Isaiah 61, the garments of praise now for the spirit of heaviness. This is what John is seeing, the new creation in all its fullness. He's wiping away the tears and the pain associated with sin and not being one with him. What an amazing thing. And he who sits on the throne says, behold, I am making, say making. Okay, that's process. I'm making all things new. There's a principle in the kingdom called the principle of gradualism. In other words, what it means is that God, by nature, not always, but mostly you see the way God works in people is a process over time. Some Christians are waiting for the rapture because they want an abracadabra like we go from zero to a hundred. It suits a lot of people's lifestyle. But in the kingdom, the Bible says the kingdom is like, it grows like a mustard seed. It's like leaven, leaven, sorry, that spreads through bread. So the kingdom of God is first the blade, then the head, then the full grain of the head. There is a process. God is building the church into a magnificent city. And a lot of Christians have no faith for that. So they would rather a rapture mindset that takes us from nothing to a glorious state. Yeah. That's not the way that God works. John is seeing, he says, 
Behold, I am making all things new. I am building a church that will be glorious. And through the church, the glory, the knowledge of the glory of God will cover all the earth. John's seen it, so it's good as done. Wow. Luke 19, 11, Jesus and the disciples are going, they're getting near to Jerusalem, the city. The disciples say, Lord, is this a time that the kingdom will appear immediately? Is this it? Is this the moment? They wanted something because they were sensing the destiny on Jerusalem, the holy city. And you're going to do it straight away? Are you coming like the rapture? Is it all happening now? And Jesus tells a parable about servants that are given 10 minors to go and occupy and to do business. He's saying to the disciples, I'm not going to come like that. It's, it's not going to be zero to 100, but I'm going to send out men and women into the harvest to build a city with me and it will be glorious. I'm going to instill in them wisdom and, and my value system. And when Jesus comes, there will be the bride, the city of God functioning in all its fullness in the city. And I believe one of the reasons God has placed me on the earth is to tell the church it's possible. And the truth is, most Christians don't believe that. Most Christians are waiting for Jesus to return. Verse 9. Then one of the angels, seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, he came and spoke with me saying, Come, here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Oh, that God would give us today that same revelation of the glorious church in all its fullness so we can see what God sees. It had the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And at each gate, there was an angel. There were 12 gates and 12 angels. Every gate has an angel. And on the names were written, and sorry, and names were written on the gates. And the names were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. A gate, an angel, and a name of a tribe of Israel on every gate. 12 gates, the gates of government. It's the kingdom of God in its fullness. On every gate is an angel, and on every gate there is a name of the tribe of Israel. Very interesting, isn't it? The word tribe in Hebrew is the word, it actually means scepter. It's, it's the word for authority. So on every gate there is a name of a tribe and it represents the authority that comes from functioning in that gate. Gates are hearts and mouths. So on every gate you have something in your heart to believe, to receive by faith, and with your mouth to release and declare. On every gate, it involves your heart and your mouth. Doesn't it say, with your heart you believe and with your mouth you confess? Our hearts are gateways. And on every gate, there is an angel standing on that gate that unlocks authority for you to operate in. What is that gate? Well, it depends on the name of the tribe of that gate. Jacob prophesied over his sons, Hebrews 11, 21. I'm reading in the Passion Translation. It said, Jacob worshipped in faith reality at the very end of his life. So Jacob is worshipping God and seeing the prophetic destiny 
over each of his children. And he leaned upon his staff, which was a picture of authority, and he imparted, it says, a prophetic blessing upon each of the sons that he had. When Joseph brought in all the sons of Jacob to feed them at the very end of that whole amazing story, he assembled them in birth order. I believe the chances of getting it right, if you didn't know who they were, was like one in 39 million. He assembles them in birth order. From Reuben to Benjamin. And we're very quickly going to go through all those gates in the holy city because every gate has an angel. Every gate has a scepter of authority that God wants to release to you. And all these gates build a city. From the gate, you have authority in the city of God to begin to function in the dominion of the kingdom on planet earth and release the glory of God. God wants you to operate in all the gates of the city. It is a glorious city, starting with Reuben all the way to Benjamin. From behold a son to the very experience of being like the son. Well, let's have a quick look because we've got 12 to get through in 24 minutes. Obviously, I'm just giving you like a little entree. You can look up all the tribes and get deeper meaning. I'm just throwing it out there. And, and what I want you to do as I go through each tribe, that is each tribe represents a gateway and an angel. And without trying to be super mystical and, and weird, well, maybe I am a bit weird, step into that. Through each tribe and gateway that I mentioned, say, God, I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll step into that. Thank you for your angel that you've assigned at that gateway to unlock authority in my life. Lord, and as the church does that, we are building a city on a hill, a light to the nations. The first gate is Reuben. Reuben means behold a son. Reuben speaks of the new birth, an impartation of God's divine nature in our lives. It's the seed of God. Behold a son. The first gateway we step into in the kingdom is the gateway of salvation. Amen. There's an authority that comes from being a child of God. There is an inherent authority. The moment you get born again, you have more authority than the enemy does. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. The Reuben gate is that very beginning. But here's the thing. If you stay at that place, if all you do is put your hand up and say, I receive you, Jesus, I want you to know that you're not going to operate as God designed you to operate. It's said of Reuben, the prophetic word over Reuben was that you will remain as unstable as water. If you stay in the baby state, the enemy's going to begin to rock your boat. Reuben, he said, you are my firstborn, my strength and the first fruits of my manhood. You are preeminent in pride and surpassing others in power. His destiny was to be a prince of God, but he lost it all because he was promiscuous. He slept with his father's concubine. Don't go into all that, but just trust me, he did what he shouldn't have done. He surpassed others in power, but he forgot that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. He had natural ability. He had a calling and a destiny from God, but he lost it all. There's no mention of a prophet, a king or a priest in this line. Here's a picture of a man or woman that gave their heart to the Lord, but did nothing, never read their Bible, never prayed, went back into the world and just lived a carnal fleshly life. Joseph gained by purity what Reuben lost by defilement. Joseph said no to Potiphar's wife 
Reuben indulged his fleshly desires. That first gateway is the gateway of salvation, a powerful gateway. An angel stands in that gateway. It's, it's a gateway of acknowledging Jesus as your Lord, but it's the first gateway. It's a powerful gateway. But if you stop there, my friend, you will miss so much. You'll go to heaven. You'll be with the Lord. Your name may be written in the Lamb's book of life, but God has way, way more. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of believers today that have said yes to Jesus and pulled the handbrake up and said, that's as bad as much as you get. God says to you, there is much, much more. The next gateway is Simeon. Simeon means a hearing ear. Oh, I love this. So after we're born again, God wants to speak to us. He wants to fellowship with us. The Holy Spirit wants to be a voice. Come and I'll show you things to come. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you don't know. Simeon, Peter, or you may call him Simon Peter, but it's really Simeon, Peter, he cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. He who he hears, sorry, he who he hears cut off the ear. I need to say that properly. He who hears cut off the ear. He who hears cut off the ear. Think about that. Simeon was an angry tribe. And without love, we cut off the ear of an unbelieving world. We interpret God's voice through our own pain and anger. So this is a second tribe where we're beginning to hear what God speaks and says. But we have to be so careful that as we hear, we don't interpret the voice of God through our own anger and disappointment. Simeon Peter, he cut off the servant's ear and because he was motivated, he heard, right? He obeyed the, the, the voice of God. Jesus said, go and find some swords. So he heard, right? But out of his anger, he misapplied what he heard. So in this gateway, we're beginning to not only hear the voice of God, but surrender our hearts to Him. There's an angel that stands over that gateway and it's the gateway of the life of hearing and obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit and not interpreting His voice through our own insecurities and pain and agenda. Yes. Well Woohoo! Number three. Well, we're getting through this. Levi means to join and attach. Their possession was God. Levi was an angry tribe like Simeon, but the wonderful thing is that God can redeem even the areas of our brokenness. And so the Levite tribe was, although they were naturally ang angry, they allowed God to harness that anger and turn it into zeal. Don't you love that? God can harness your greatest weakness and turn it into your greatest strength. So Levi means to join and attach. They are those that realise that they are the bride of Christ and they are determined to join their hearts to the Lord. This is a third gateway. It's a powerful gateway where we understand that our possession is God. We are attached. Our hearts are attached to His heart. Wow. Moses came down the mountain and found the people worshipping the golden calf. And he said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come and stand next to me. And so who turned up? The Levites. And they picked up their swords and they started slaughtering people because they had this disposition of zeal. But their passion was, we are for the Lord. We are for the Lord. There was a holy zeal that says, my heart is His. My heart is His. My heart is His and His alone. Isn't it a very powerful gateway? You see, 
The Bible says that you've got to go through gateways to come into greater authority, like the camel who goes through the eye of the needle. And so we relinquish all our own desires and we say, Lord, not my will, but yours. And we surrender ourselves like that rich man who failed to make Jesus Lord. But if he had have gone through the eye of the needle on that same chapter in Mark chapter 10, on the other side was the hundredfold return. And so we begin to understand that, Lord, there is a place, there is authority at this gate. My friend, there is an angel at this gate. If you stop fighting and just say, God, you are Lord of my life. There is authority that comes from that. Yeah, really. Judah means praise. It's a fourth gate. Leah gives birth to Judah. Leah is the unloved wife of Jacob. Jacob doesn't have the hots for Leah. She's got eyes that, well, they're, they're, they're not the nicest. She's got a face only a mother could love. And uh, he got her by default. And she's tried everything. She's tried cooking him chocolate puddings and meat pies. And she's tried putting on a lacy dress at night to turn him on. But nothing seems to work. He's only making love to her because he feels obliged. She wants, well, that's what the Bible says. So I'm just telling you the facts. There's a lot of pain in her heart. It's not her fault that she's not, you know, 10 out of 10. She's a good wife, a good mother, but she's unloved. And she names her son, after all this pain, Judah. And she says, this time I will praise even though I don't have what I want. This fourth gateway is the gate of praise. It says, though the fig tree doesn't blossom and there be no fruit on the vine, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. It is a gateway that we say, I will praise no matter what. Who shall we send in Judges chapter 1 into the army, into the fight of the Lord? And the Lord says, send Judah, send praise. And so in this gateway, the church is beginning to discover we praise even when we don't feel like it. We are a band on wheels. We are a worshipping people. Amen. And Judah says, I'm going to worship. Leah said, you know what? My husband may never love me. I may never get what I want, but I'm going to worship the Lord. And from Judah comes the King of kings and Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. There's an angel at the gate of praise. See, as we go to each gate and experience the reality, we are building a city. God's people become a glorious city. This is what John's seeing in the spirit. He sees a city and every gate there's an angel and a name of a tribe. Hmm. Dan, vindication. His name means judge or vindication. What does Isaiah 54 end with? Verse 17. In the NIV says, and my vindication is from the Lord. Dan is where we refuse to vindicate ourselves. We go through seasons where we're misunderstood, where things don't make sense. Paul said, I don't even judge myself. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to judge others and judge myself. I refuse to promote myself or defend myself. We all go through seasons where people misunderstand us. They judge our character. They don't know what we're going through and they say terrible things about us and we want to defend ourselves or we want to promote ourselves. And it's a painful gate, this one, but there's an angel at the gate when you don't vindicate yourself, you allow God. Jesus was made the judge because he allowed God to be his vindicator. He is the judge of all the earth because he uttered not a word to defend himself. He allowed God to be the vindicator. 
I don't like this one. Because sometimes people can be awfully cruel. And you think, God, if I don't say something, all these people are going to think all these things about me, which are totally untrue. And God says, shut your mouth. And I say, do you have another plan? I thought about this. David had men that spoke such terrible things. That who was that guy? I forget his name. It was cursing him as he left the city and and throwing stuff at him. You know, you look it up, you'll find his name. Somebody should know his name. Find it out. Remember when when he Absalom threw overthrew the kingdom. David's been sent out and that man's cursing him. Somebody find his name. So, so it feels like I'm not just making it up. He's cursing him out and David says nothing. He could vindicate himself. He's done nothing wrong. After David dies, before he dies, he says, Solomon, sort him out. Sometimes the vindication comes after we die. Are you willing to let that go? Are you willing to allow God to be the judge? There is an angel at the gateway of Dan that says, God, you be my vindicator. I am not going to try and justify myself, vindicate myself, promote myself. You are the judge. And if you will do that and I will do that, There is an authority that comes from being silent. Someone found that man's name? Sorry? Shimai. Shimai. Well, he met an ugly death, didn't he? Leave him in the hands of the Lord. Naphtali, number six, means wrestle or my struggle. We wrestle with our own nature, our attitudes, I don't know about you, but after you've been saved for many years and sometimes you look at yourself and you think, oh, God, when will I learn? Some of these things, maybe you don't relate to this, maybe you're all pure and holy and ready to be raptured like Enoch, but for the ones of us that tell the truth, (laughs) there are things that we wrestle with, we wrestle with, Areas of weakness. And Jacob, you know that he wrestled with a man and received a name change. He was struck on his hip, his thigh bone, wasn't it? Which is the strongest muscle in your body. And it was forever made weak as a reminder. And the Jews still, they don't eat the thigh bone as a remembrance of that. That in our weakness, we are made strong. We wrestle. But isn't it wonderful But his name also means a deer let loose, the one who uses beautiful words. That's what's spoken over him. So when you wrestle with God and you come to a place of surrender, there's something sweet that comes out of that wrestle and it changes the way you now speak. His land, Naphtali's land, was near the Sea of Galilee. It was a place where Jesus did much of his teaching and ministry. Don't you love that? In the place where you wrestle with God, out of that comes an oasis of revelation and teaching and life. There's an angel that stands while you wrestle. In the midnight hour when there's no one there and you're wrestling, God, change me, change me. You see these flaws and these wrong desires. Please, and you wrestle with God to the breaking of the day. And out of that wrestle, there comes revelation. My greatest revelations come from my deepest pain and wrestling. Gad, which is, I was gonna, what's it backwards? Anyway, Gad. His name means good fortune or troop. The meaning behind his name is the ability to multiply ourselves 
in other people. It's all about legacy. You see, we're progressing in the gates towards Benjamin. From Reuben, who was saved but nothing else, got the handbrake on, to a man like Benjamin that is just like Jesus. Gad, he's one that multiplies himself. I said before when God called Abraham, it was but one, but God blessed him and made him many. Now we stand at a gate where we see God has something for me that's bigger than me. When you first start out in the Christian walk, it's all about you. Whether you want to be the greatest business person, the best preacher, the best this, it's bless me, it's all about me, enlarge me. And these are all great things. But as you go on in the Lord, you realise that having sons and daughters, multiplying what is in you in other people is the greatest calling that you can have. Jesus, his, his claim to fame was the 11 disciples that he left that were just like him, that would change the world. The tribe of Gad retreat, uh, received a great blessing from the Lord. In fact, they received the best of the promised land because they played this role in helping all the other brothers receive their inheritance. Here's the thing. If you invest in other people and see to it that they get the best, if you sow your life into blessing other people, God will see to it that you get the best of the land. It's the law of the kingdom. There's an angel that's on that gate that says, that empowers you to see prophetically into the lives of other people and say, there's a son, there's a daughter, invest your life in them. And as you do that, there is untapped blessing for you. Asher. Asher means happy one or blessed. We're almost done. Moses has a prophecy about Asher that's incredible. He says, most blessed of sons is Asher. Let him be favoured by his brothers and let him bathe his feet in oil. Oil soaked feet speak of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, speaks of the oil of gladness. Jesus, because he hated iniquity and loved righteousness, was anointed with the oil of joy more than anyone that walked the earth. This is the tribe, there's a gateway of coming into a realm of supernatural joy. Isaiah 54, Bill Johnson talks about this chapter and he says that God has a plan to use the happy ones in his kingdom to inherit the nations. It starts, sing, O barren, rejoice, shout aloud. It's saying to the one that's sucking their thumb, the eors of the church, start to rejoice. I don't feel like it. Rejoice anyway. Sing, shout, have a happy disposition. Because he goes on to say, your descendants will inherit the nations. There is a direct correlation. God is not sending out the sad sacks of the church to inherit the nations. Why? Because they don't represent their father. He is the God of all joy and gladness. You go, well, I've got nothing to be joyful about. You do. Because your husband has come to rescue you. He wants to do a great work in you. It's the happy ones. We've only got a few more to go. Issachar, his name means there is a reward or God is my reward. The Bible says, He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Do you know what He rewards us with? He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Do you know what He rewards us with? It's not a trick question. More of Himself. You go, oh, but I wanted a car. No, you don't understand. When you get Him, you get the whole kick and caboodle. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the unlimited one. All the resources are in heaven. You don't need more money, more health, more joy. You need more of him. He is the rewarder. He says, you come and seek me, you'll get more of me. And if you get more of me, you'll get more of what you need. There is a reward. Issachar were also, the sons of Issachar were donkeys. Issachar is a strong donkey. 
They are burden bearers. Issachar were the tribe that had the ability to understand the times and seasons and know what Israel needed to do. Like the donkey, they, the donkey is the one that carried Jesus into Jerusalem. <laughs> there was a clue there. The donkey carried Jesus into Jerusalem. So the donkey is partnering with Jesus because it discerns the times and the seasons. Jesus becomes their prayer partner. So Issachar is a picture of the intercessor, the prayer warrior, the one that, see, we're, we're progressing from Reuben, now we're up to Issachar, where we're beginning to bear the burdens of Christ. His heart for the city, his love, he weeps over Jerusalem and Issachar is carrying Jesus into the city. He's beginning to see the city like Jesus sees the city. Amazing. There's an angel over that gateway that when you cry out, Jesus! Show me your love for this city. Help me to carry your heart into this city. There's an angel at that gateway that says, boom, I'm ready to help you. That's what John was seeing. I'm not making this up about angels. John saw, this is how God works. As we step into these gateways, remember, a gate is your heart and your mouth. So you begin to believe, God, I have that Issachar anointing. I I just receive that today. I confess that. I want to be your burden bearer. You're the donkey that carries you into this city. Send forth your anointing on my life. Open up that realm in the spirit for me. And God begins to do that. Zebulun, three to go. Is this okay? Good. Well, I don't have another sermon, so I'll just keep going on this one. His name means dwelling place, the habitation of God. Can you see where we're beginning to come to a climax here? He is the tribe in whose territory Jesus lived and began his ministry. Of Zebulun, it says, they were the first to see a light dawning. They're seeing the breaking of a new day. Oh, to God that we could see in the spirit realm the breaking in of the glory of God that will take over cities and nations, a dwelling place. A dwell so Zebulun begins to understand that God's intention is to indwell his people, a city that is God and man mixed together. Or should we leave that to after the rapture or whatever it is that you believe in? I want it now, don't you? What if, what if the millennium began right after Jesus was raised from the dead and it's unplaying itself? See, a thousand years isn't a literal term because God owns the cattle on the thousand hills. So all the other hills in the, in the, in the world, they're not his. No, it's an it's a idiom, it's a term for lots. So what if... The millennium is unpacking itself. The rule and reign. Jesus spoke of a kingdom that was ever increasing. Anyway, if that's your golden child, the millennium, God bless you. Have a good life. <laughs> Two more to go. Joseph. Say Joseph. His name means may he add another one. How would you like it to be born... And you come out of the womb and your mother's saying, hey, I'm looking forward to the next one. <laughs> hey, what about me, Mum? <laughs> as soon as Jesus was born on the earth, God had on his mind many sons and daughters. Staggering, isn't it? Joseph is the, by far the clearest picture of Jesus out of any character. Over 50 direct connections between his life and Jesus. It's mind-boggling. The church is beginning to pick up that sound that God's saying, I so desire 
for my children to be just like Jesus. We put Jesus up here and us down there. And in a sense, that's right. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't want ever intimate that's not the case. But he came that we would see him and be like him. He came to lift us up, to lift us up to be like him, to carry his fullness. Joseph was a man who suffered at the hands of his brothers. So don't be surprised if you press into God and believe for more that your own brothers will try to kill you. Mark 10 says that after going through the eye of the needle and coming out the other side and getting a hundredfold return, he says, you've got to be careful, God's, God's Jehovah sneaky. <laughs> because he puts in that little phrase, I'm going to give you a hundredfold houses, mother-in-laws, cars, all these things. And he has right at the end with a little persecution stirred in for good measure. Why? Because the Joseph anointing pulls out. It says that his brothers were like bitter archers. They shot him with arrows of jealousy and accusation. I remember watching people on fire for Jesus and then others would misunderstand it. It's like the woman who, who breaks the, her jar, and alabaster jar, and she pours it over Jesus, and the whole room is like, it ticked off with her. It's like, how could you misunderstand her devotion to Jesus? Like you doofus. They want to spend their money on the poor. Look after the seed called Jesus and we'll have more than enough for the poor. This is your one moment to get it right. And they misunderstood Joseph and they accused him. And at this gateway, we're beginning to see that God's deep desire is to add another, to make us like Jesus. Joseph is a fruitful vine by a well. He's branching out like Jesus. We've become part of that tree. We're bearing the same fruit as him. And at this gate, because we've learned to keep our mouth closed, remember? We've learned all the, those things of giving our heart to the Lord, of praising. When the brothers come and they misunderstand us, it won't matter. What a gateway. There's an angel at the gateway of Joseph. And the last gateway, and all God's people said amen, is Benjamin. His name means son of my right hand. Jesus has designed it that we would co-reign with him, be seated with him. We've gone from Reuben to Benjamin, the fullness of the kingdom. The Benjamin company is a left-handed group. Do you remember in the old days? So you won't remember because you're too young. But my mother tells me this is true because she's quite old. <laughs> that in the old days, if you were left-handed, they would slap your hand. They get a ruler out and you couldn't write with your left hand, you have to write with your right. They thought left-handers were evil, witches and all sorts of weird things. The Benjamin Company is left-handed because they grasp the right hand of God. Did you get that? They're left-handed because they instinctively know how to grasp the right hand of God. Paul the Apostle came from the tribe of Benjamin, the one man that had the greatest revelation of what it means to be a son and daughter of the living God. When Rachel gave birth to Joseph, she said, God will add another son. And he did. And I'm closing all in a second. It's very interesting that when Judah returns from seeing Joseph, he goes back to his dad and they're having a discussion around the campfire, all the sons, Jacob. Jacob needs to send his, some of his sons back because they, they've got some trouble back in Egypt and they need some food. And Judah says to Jacob, Joseph has said, if you, if you don't bring Benjamin back so I see his face, 
you will never see my face. Was God saying, until the heavenly Joseph sees a company of Benjamins, you won't see his face. Jesus is not going to return until the body of Christ are a company of Benjamins. Is this making sense? We're saying, come Lord Jesus, bring the rapture, bring the mark of the beast, the antichrist, bring left behind all this crazy stuff and God's up in heaven saying, hey, you want to see Jesus? Show me the Benjamins. Show me the men and the women that have learned to sit at my right hand and rule and reign with me. Show me the city on a hill that is displaying the nature of God. So remember I said last week, and maybe some of you glazed over, but last week I was trying to show you the book of Revelation is about the coming of of the Lord Jesus. He comes in the clouds. The clouds are the company of Benjamin. When we are like him, we will see him. We're waiting for Jesus and he's waiting for us. We're saying, come Lord Jesus, he said, I will when I see Benjamin. And so all these gates, there's an angel at the gate with authority. And my prayer for the church is that we will step into all these gates and allow Jesus to conform us to himself. So we are the same as him. We go through the wrestling and the the not vindicating ourselves. We are people of praise. We go, oh, that sounds exhausting, 12 gates. No, there's a grace. There is a grace. We posture our hearts and say, Lord, I see this gate. I'm way, way away from that. But would you, Lord, would you draw me into that place? And once God brings you into that gate, you now have authority in, see, because the gate is a place of authority to administer Revelation 22, which is healing to the nations. And the nations are healed with the leaves, which is a picture of our tongue, the leaves of the trees. And so now we've, we carry a dimension in this gate to re, because we've not vindicated ourselves, we have the authority to now bring judgment into cities, and I don't mean to judge them, but to bring like Solomon wisdom to solve problems, to bring strategies and solutions because we've found authority at the gate. So, there you go. Let's give the Lord a hand. So, Lord. We by faith access those 12 gates with angels and names of the tribe. We thank you. There's authority in each gate. No matter where we find ourselves, we say we step in to more like the mustard seed in the kingdom that takes us from glory to glory, from faith to faith. Lord, I pray, build in this church a glorious city that is able to function in the government of God, the 12 gates can stand with you like the tribe of Benjamin and begin to, Lord, operate as men and women that sit at your right hand. And you said, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. And we thank you, Lord, that Lord, the enemies of doubt and sickness and poverty and lack and suicide and mental health, all the enemies of you, Lord, shall bow their knee because there's a company of men and women that carry the Benjamin gate anointing to sit in authority and rule and reign with you. And as we do that, Lord, come, come, Maranatha, Come, Lord, come into this nation, come into this city in wave after wave until your glory fills the earth and then you shall appear and we will see you in the fullness of your glory. So, Father, let there be an Enoch people that walk with God and are not. Lord, we want to be people that are so entwined with your heart I ask in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that these words will activate a fresh hunger 
and a passion in the hearts of your people. And as they go out this week, may they go out into their workplaces, wherever they find themselves, in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. May they be witnesses to the beauty of Jesus. May they carry the presence of God everywhere they go. Lord, I pray that they would be a holy city like Jerusalem, God and man mingled, that wherever they go, people will sense that God has arrived and turned up. Father, release Your glory through Your people this week. We ask in Jesus' Name. And if there are people here today listening to my voice on live stream or YouTube and you've never received Jesus as your Lord, today is the day. The first gate is the gate of Reuben where we behold the Son. His name is Jesus and we become a son. And Jesus said that through His Word that if we believe with our heart and confess with our mouth, if we believe that Jesus died for us to save us, to be our Lord, to come into our lives, and we confess this with our mouth, He said that we would be born again. To those that believed in Him, He gave the right, the authority to become children of God. And if you've never done that, the greatest gate, you can't go through any other gate, only Jesus, He's the way. The first gate is the gate of Reuben. It's the gate of salvation. So today, I invite you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Ask Him into your life. He will come in and live inside you and you'll never be the same again. So we say, Lord, for those that, that need that, knock on the door of their heart. Draw them to yourself today by your Spirit. In Jesus' name. 